All right, so correct me if I'm wrong, but we had left off on Thursday. We had just spoken about the Neanderthals and we had just talking, we had just introduced the concept that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens may have possibly interbred. And we talked about the Neanderthal Genome Project. Does that sound familiar? All right, so let's talk about Homo sapiens. So this is our species. So we see the emergence of Homo sapiens originally in Africa. So we see Homo sapiens originate in Africa by no later than 200,000 years before present, possibly a little bit sooner. There are some preliminary studies that show that Homo sapiens may have been around in Northern Africa as early as 300,000 years ago, but we know certainly by about 200,000 years before present, they are present in Africa. And then from that point in time, they then begin to migrate outwards. So they have a second migration out of Africa. Homo erectus left Africa about 1.8 million years ago. And then Homo sapiens left Africa, started to leave Africa probably around their emergence, but reached Asia by about 100,000 years before present, arrived in Australia by about 50,000 years before present, arrived in Europe by about 35,000 years before present, and arrived in the Americas by about 15,000 years before present. So some of the characteristics that we're going to see, just like the Neanderthals, they have a large cranial capacity. So anywhere from about 1,200 to 1,700 cc's, but the average for Homo sapiens is right around 1,400, whereas for the Neanderthals, it was right around 1,500. So on average, the cranial capacity of Homo sapiens is actually a little bit smaller than the Neanderthals. But of course, even though their cranial capacity is similar, the structure and the shape of their crania is quite different. So Homo sapiens will have a much more rounded globular shape to their crania. They also have a much more vertical forehead. So start at your brow and feel all the way up towards your hairline. We have a very vertical forehead. We have small or even non-existent brow ridges in comparison to some of the early mem earlier members of genus Homo, thinking back to the Neanderthals and Homo erectus, they had a really prominent double arch brow. And Homo sapiens in comparison, we have a very gracile or small brow ridge. We have a narrow nasal aperture. Remember that's the opening where the, no where the nasal bones would go. We have a pronounced chin. Everybody feel their chin. We have a pronounced chin. We have also a pyramid shaped large mastoid process behind our ears. So everybody feel your chin and behind your ears. Those features are unique to Homo sapiens. The mastoid process is behind your ears and the protruding mandibular symphysis is your chin, or you might see it called mental protuberance. In the back of our skull in the occipital region, it's much more rounded. And from the neck down, postcranially, so our postcranial anatomy is much more gracile in comparison to the Neanderthals. Remember, Neanderthals have very thick, robust, bones since they engaged in lots of dangerous hunting strategies. They were likely traveling very far daily just to gather enough food and to hunt. So that required them to be very robust, very muscular, very strong. And then in comparison, Homo sapiens have a taller, lankier, more gracile structure. So that should remind us way back from the human adaptation chapter, we talked about Allen and Bergman's rule. So Allen and Bergman's rule states that cold adapted mammals are shorter, stouter, and more muscular, and Homo sapiens are more warm adapted, taller, and lankier, and leaner. All right, so this slide here is going to show you the comparison between a Neanderthal and modern Homo sapiens. So you see that even though they have a very similar cranial capacity, they have a their structure is quite different. So you're seeing the lateral view here, a view from the side. So Neanderthals almost have this kind of football-shaped crania. It's very long, low cranial vault. They have the really pronounced double arch brow ridge here. They have the occipital bun. That's the feature where the nuchal ligament will attach. They have kind of this mid-face prognathism. So their maxilla area kind of juts forward a little bit when you look at it from the side. And they have almost kind of sunken in zygomatic bones, sunken in cheekbones. Whereas Homo sapiens, we see this really tall, vertical forehead, more rounded overall cranial shape, really small, delicate, gracile brow ridges, 
and we see the actual presence of a chin. So protruding mandibular symphysis or mental protuberance, that is something that is unique to Homo sapiens. We don't see that in any other hominin species. Um, also, the occipital region is much more rounded. We don't have the bunning like we do in the Neanderthal. All right. All right, behavioral-wise, so just like the Neanderthals and Heidelbergensis, they likely hunted a wide range of medium-sized game animals. They likely had a very diverse diet, so that has been proposed as one of the reasons why Homo sapiens may have been superiorly adapted in comparison to the Neanderthals, in comparison to Heidelbergensis and other hominin species they may have encountered. So they were not only hunting terrestrial game, they were also engaging in fishing and accessing aquatic food resources. And they have, were, of course, also accessing plant resources and tubers and fruit where it was available and insects. So they had a very diverse, varied diet. Their tool technology is also considered to be more sophisticated than their predecessors. They utilize Upper Paleolithic Arignacian tool technology. So it's much more sophisticated, much more refined, also allowed them to hunt game animals from far away. So that was another, that's another factor that may have possibly given Homo sapiens an advantage in comparison to the Neanderthals, because Neanderthals were utilizing hunting strategies that required them to be very, very close to very dangerous game. And Neanderthals were oftentimes severely injured or even killed through the hunting process. So not that that is impossible for, for that to happen to Homo sapiens. I'm sure Homo sapiens during that time frame also sometimes were injured or killed through the hunting process, but it happened less frequently, likely, especially according to the evid evidence that we do have in the fossil record. We don't see nearly as many examples of skeletal fractures in Homo sapiens in comparison to the Neanderthals. So Homo sapiens may have had more sophisticated tools. They may have had... Um, hunting techniques that were not quite as dangerous it didn't put them in the same amount of danger as their neanderthal predecessors they also had just like the neanderthals they had ritualistic burial practices they used a variety of symbolic objects such as cave figurines and cave paintings so again more and more examples of symbolic expression and behavioral modernity so just because the neanderthals it is important to remember just to you know make sure we don't fall uh, victim to that stereotype of Neanderthals being dumb or brutish or somehow less intelligent, it is important to note that it is very possible that Neanderthals were fully capable intellectually of these things. However, they just lived in a harsher environment. They were living in Europe and the Middle East and Western Asia during the last Pleistocene. So they were trying to survive during the Ice Age in a very harsh environment. So it may have simply been that the Neanderthals were, they didn't have any free time. They didn't have any time to spend on creating beautiful cave art or creating um, figurines and statuettes. Whereas Homo sapiens, they may have, you know, as they arrived in Europe and as we started to come out of the Ice Age, they may have um, simply had more time to engage in these activities. All right, let's talk about some of the kind of what we call enigmas or surprises. So Homo floresiensis is a species that was a surprise to paleoanthropologists. Homo floresiensis, you may have heard, also called the hobbit. So this particular fossil, there's two fossils that were found attributed to this species. There's LB1 and LB2. So they were found on the island of Flores in Indonesia. Their date range is as recently as 100,000 to 60,000 years before present. So they were existing in Indonesia and Flores Island at the same time that Homo sapiens were existing. Homo sapiens were not likely on Flores Island during this time, but they were existing on the planet at this time. They also coexisted possibly with Homo erectus, Homo um, with Homo heidelbergensis, as well as potentially with the Neanderthals. Obviously, all these species are in different regions, but it's important to note that Homo floresiensis was alive at the same time as many other hominin species with this extremely recent date range. So this is considered such a surprise because we have a relatively small-brained hominin with a primitive anatomy and still existing relative, relatively recently. So the biggest hypothesis, or the most supported hypothesis, I should say, is that Homo floresiensis is an example of 
both genetic drift, the founder effect, and island dwarfism. So thinking way back to the very beginning of the semester during unit one, when we discussed the forces of evolution, we did discuss that there is a force of evolution that can occur when a certain subset of a population becomes isolated. So say, for example, if there's 100,000 members of Homo erectus living on the mainland, and let's say that randomly, oh, let's say 500 of them, 500 of them are able to migrate over to Flores Island in Indonesia. So that 500 are then isolated from the parent population. That 500 is now considered the founder population. So they're genetically and geographically isolated from the parent population, and they're now adapting to the circumstances that exist on Flores Island. They're no longer subject to the same predators that are present on the mainland. They're no longer, uh, they may not have access to the same food resources because typically an island environment is going to have less food resources available. So that's why it's advantageous for organisms that live on an island to dwarf in body size. So of course this won't happen overnight because the process of evolution takes hundreds if not thousands of generations. But over time, evolution would select for a smaller and smaller body size for organisms that are isolated and living on an island. So that's what we call island dwarfism. So animals that are large on the mainland evolve to be smaller on an island as an adaptation to limited resources in an island environment. So quite simply, there's just le less food resources available on an island in comparison to the mainland. And the bigger your body size is, the more calories are required to support that large body size. So it makes sense in evolutionary terms that if you're restricted to an island, the smaller your body size is, the more, the more adaptable you are, the more likely you are to survive because you won't need as many calories to support that body size. So that's what we mean by island dwarfism, simply the idea that animals that are isolated on an island will over generations become smaller and smaller in body size. But Homo floresiensis is also considered to be a great example of the founder effect because it is very likely that Homo floresiensis is a subset of Homo erectus or a portion of a Homo erectus population that became isolated on Flores Island. All right, let's watch a little video clip on this one. So this is another small segment from, oh, here, I'll just bring it up this way. This is another small segment from that Becoming Human documentary that we watched a little bit of, not last class period, but a couple class periods ago. All right. Is it in the right spot? Oh, but it is in the right spot. Perfect. All right. So let's go ahead and watch this clip and then we'll talk about it. So if, while you're watching this, think about why is Homo floresiensis influential to the field of paleoanthropology? Why is it a big deal? And why was it a surprise? How had a small, primitive Homo erectus migrated to the Caucasus almost two million years ago, long before Turkanaboy? Scientists now accept that as soon as Homo erectus appeared on the savannas of Africa, they started to leave. Suddenly, with the origin of Homo erectus, we get this shift in body shape, and then boom, they're out of Africa right away. The Georgia fossils proved that Homo erectus left Africa much earlier than previously thought. An even more provocative find shows the migration may have started even earlier. 5,000 miles from Africa, the island of Flores, Indonesia. In 2003, Researchers made a discovery so strange, nobody knew what to make of it. They found the bones of a tiny human ancestor, just over three feet tall, even smaller than the Dimenisi fossils. They called this baffling new ancestor Homo floresiensis, and because of its tiny size, nicknamed it the Hobbit. This has created a tremendous amount of grief because we're not really sure what we're seeing here. Uh, the size of the hobbit brain endocast is roughly 400 cc's. 
That's barely bigger than the brain of Lucy, the famous bipedal ape from three million years ago. It's not just a small brain and a primitive looking face, but the foot is primitive, the hand's primitive, the leg is primitive. The lower limb is very much like the Lucy skeleton. That was a big surprise. And in the cave where this primitive creature was found, they also uncovered stone tools, something Lucy never had. People have for a long time said, well, you need a big brain to make stone tools. Uh, well, okay, if Homo floresiensis is making stone tools, this creature has a brain the size of an orange. Clearly, that equation's gone. Everything about these creatures is an enigma. Where did they come from, and what were they? Some researchers have argued that Floresiensis is just a dwarfed population of modern people that suffered some kind of disease that caused them to both dwarf and have relatively small brains. But when scientists took a closer look, most saw no evidence of disease. The stone tools and the shape of the face moved the focus to our old friend, Homo erectus. Some researchers think that Homo floresiensis evolved from Homo erectus. But how did they get so small? Something called island dwarfism may be the answer. Isolated on islands with limited food, large mammals sometimes shrink over time. On Flores, there were once pygmy elephants the size of calves. Could the same evolutionary pressure have acted on Homo erectus to produce the hobbit? Or was this mysterious creature descended from an even more primitive ancestor? So perhaps we're sampling a period which is at the very beginning of the Homo lineage. So whatever the hobbit was, perhaps its ancestors were the very first wave of migration out of Africa some unknown creature, part bipedal ape like Lucy, and part Homo erectus. So if that's the case, then what we see in Indonesia makes sense. It's kind of a body that existed before human bodies became more modern. What would push such primitive creatures out of Africa? A key driving force behind the migration was probably a climate shift, which spread grasslands from Africa into Asia. And with the grasses went the game animals. Animals are going to be moving out of Africa, and the hominids will just be keeping pace with those animals. After all, that's their livelihood. Of course, our ancestors didn't know they were leaving Africa. They just followed the animals they depended on, through the Sinai up into the Middle East and beyond. It's often been called an exodus, but it really wasn't like that. When people think of exodus, they think of the Bible, or they think of migration, they think of Europeans coming over here to the New World. It probably wasn't like any historical migration, this dispersal of humans out of Africa. The process was probably very, very slow, much like the spread of any other animal species into new territories. You could imagine a group of Homo erectus moving their range a kilometer a year in one direction and doing that continually over a long enough period of time you can get the distance from Africa to Indonesia covered in say 15,000 years. By a million years ago our ancestors had populated Asia from the Caucasus to Indonesia. And they were in Europe too as a recent discovery in Spain has shown. Homo erectus had conquered the old world. The fact that they made... All right, so according to what we just watched, what were, the, what were the motivations for these early hominins to migrate out of Africa? So why did Homo erectus leave Africa, essentially? 
You know, following food sources. Excellent. Following game animals, following food sources. So that was the motivation. Of course, two million years ago, Homo erectus didn't necessarily realize they were migrating out of Africa. They just knew that they were following the game animals that they needed to survive. So, you know, through this process, you know, over millions of years, thousands of years, excuse me, over thousands of years, they were able to reach far regions of the globe. So this is essentially why they migrated out of Africa. Starting about 1.8 million years ago is when Homo erectus left Africa. And then there was a second exodus likely when Homo sapiens left Africa as well. But we'll talk about the theories on that here in a moment. All right, this is just one of those summary slides. This is Homo floresiensis, nickname is the Hobbit. There are two fossils that are attributed, attributed to the species that were found in, on Flores Island in Indonesia. The first one is LB1, second one is LB2. The date range for the species is about 100,000 to as recently as 60,000 years before present. The site is Flores Island in Indonesia. Some of the features at adulthood, Homo floresiensis would have stood about 3.3 feet tall. From the, from the neck down, postcranially, they were very primitive. They had a body plan more like an Australopithecine. So they had those long arms and flat feet, which were indicating some degree of arboreal climbing. So they were likely um, habitual bipeds, not obligate. So they had relatively small dentition and they had ornathic rather than prognathic faces. So those last two features are, those are more modern features. And they have evidence for the process or the phenomenon of island dwarfism, which essentially just means that mammals that become isolated in an island environment will tend to get smaller as the generations go on. So natural selection selects for a smaller and smaller body size simply because that is more adaptive for them in that island environment. So the biggest theory out there is that Homo floresiensis is a wonderful example of the founder effect, which remember is a type of genetic drift. So the founder effect where a subset of Homo erectus became isolated on Flores Island. All right, let's talk about another one of those surprises or enigmas. This is Homo naledi, which we've already been introduced a little bit, introduced to a little bit during our discussion, I believe it was not last week, but the week before, discussion post number six, we watched the Dawn of Humanity documentary and that looked at both Australopithecus sediba as well as Homo naledi. Homo naledi is a surprise because again, we have a relatively primitive postcranial anatomy, a relatively small cranial capacity. However, they're behaving in very complex ways and they have a very, a very recent date range. So the date range for this particular cave, it doesn't mean it's the date range for the species, just what we know so far about the cave is the date range is about 335,000 to as recently as 226,000 years before present. And we know that cranial shape is more like early members of genus Homo. Cranial capacity is within the range of what we would expect for both Australopithecines and early members of genus Homo. Uh, from the neck down, they actually look more similar to the Australopithecines. They have shoulders that are adapted for arboreal climbing. They have a mosaic pelvis. They have long curved finger bones. So those are all features that indicate a habitual degree of bipedalism rather than an obligate one. So Homo naledi was likely a habitual biped. Um, also some features that have similarities with Homo erectus, like a sagittal keel, a large double arch brow ridge, smaller teeth and mandibles. Those are all more genus Homo type features. Um, also behavior wise, they likely or possibly were controlling fire. I don't know if you guys saw, but I did post an announcement recently. Lee Berger just last week came out and announced that they have discovered the remains of fire pits and the remains of charcoal and charred animal bones. So it is very likely that in the Rising Star Chamber, Homo naledi was not only intentionally burying their dead, but they were also using fire to light their way, possibly using fire to cook food. And, you know, of course, to us, that may seem like a relatively minor thing. However, when we think about, you know, the prior to this, prior to this discovery, there wasn't really a whole lot of evidence that there was control of fire, cooking, persistence hunting, until we get to hominins that have a cranial capacity of at least 800 cc's and larger. 
So Homo naledi is showing us that that's not necessarily the case, that it's very possible for a relatively small brained hominin to behave in very complex ways, to be intentionally burying the dead, to be controlling fire in a, you know, and getting into cave sites that are sometimes very dangerous and difficult to get into. So it's very likely that they were using fire to light their way. So they had harnessed that control to allow them to access this cave site. So the reason Lieberger and colleagues feel that this is an intentional burial site is because of the hominins that are found. They see examples of the very young and the very old. We're talking age-wise. So that's very typical of what you would see in a cemetery population because those are the age groups that are most subject to um, diseases, to injuries, to you know, essentially death. It's the very young and the very old. Uh, and then also in the site, in the Donaldi chamber, only hominin, bound, only hominin bones were found. I think there were some, like a couple owl bones, but really it was the only, only hominin bones. So it's not like this is a site where carnivores were just carrying remains into the cave. This is likely not that. It's li likely, likely Homo naledi was intentionally visiting these chambers. All right, another one that's considered kind of an enigma or a surprise is the Denisovians. So we talked about Homo floresiensis, we talked about Homo naledi, and then the Denisovians. So the Denisovians are kind of a surprise because they likely interbred with Neanderthals and possibly Homo sapiens. But they, they likely had more incidents or more occasions of interbreeding with Neanderthals in comparison to Homo sapiens. So the only fossil remains we have of the Denisovians are from a Siberian cave called Denisovia. Date range for this cave is about 48,000 to as recently as 30,000 years before present. They are believed to be slightly more closely related to the Neanderthals than to Homo sapiens. So that's why we say it's likely that they interbred with the Neanderthals more frequently. But they also likely interbred with Homo sapiens. Because we do see in modern populations, just like they did the Neanderthal genome study, if we, can if we compare the genomes of the Denisovians to that of modern humans, we see that modern humans from Southeast Asia and Australia share as much as 6% of their genome with the Denisovians. And we also know that modern Tibetans have the EPASI gene that has also been found in Denisovian DNA. So thinking back again to our human adaptation chapter, we talked about this gene a little bit during that chapter. That is a gene that allows for more effective oxygen exchange between mother and fetus, and it helps Tibetans live in extremely high altitudes. So it's interesting that we see that there's these obviously genetic connections, and we see this particular gene that we know is a very specific adaptation to hypoxia or essentially living in low oxygen conditions. So we see that gene in the Denisovians as well as in modern day Tibetans. So it's really, I mean, what these studies have found us, what these discoveries are beginning to show us is that it's very likely that many of these species were cohabitating, many of these species were interbreeding, many of these species were leaving descendants essentially. So it may be possible that it's not appropriate to think of all of these species as evolutionary dead ends. It's very possible that many of these species were interbreeding with each other and contributing genes to the modern gene pool. So the process of evolution may be more like a braided delta instead of a tree. We'll talk about that more here in a moment. All right, so now there's two classic hypotheses on the origins of modern Homo sapiens. And this is an area of hot debate in the field of paleoanthropology. When I was going to school, for example, you know, there were whole departments that were divided over this topic that really, you know, really passionately thought one way or the other about the origins of Homo sapiens. So the two classic hypotheses I'm going to discuss right now, and then I'm going to show you a couple new ones. So the out of Africa two hypothesis on modern human origins is stating that modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa, and then they spread to, to Asia and Europe where these modern humans would replace all of the populations they encountered. So this hypothesis basically does not leave any room for the possibility of interbreeding. It basically says that once Homo sapiens encountered any other species, whether it be Heidelbergensis or the Neanderthals or Homo erectus or Floresiensis or Homo naledi, no matter who they encountered, they essentially wiped out, according to this hypothesis. 
So according to this hypothesis, Homo sapiens originated in Africa, migrated outwards, made it to, you know, made it to Asia by about 100,000 years ago, made it to Europe by about 40,000 years ago, made it to the Americas by about 15,000 years ago. But essentially, wherever they encountered other species, they genetically swamped them or wiped them out, according to the out of Africa model. All right, the other one that's kind of the opposite of that, or the one in opposition to that, is what we call the multi-regional continuity model. So this is basically stating that the shift to modern humans and to modernity took place regionally and did not involve complete replacement. So this one is the one, this is the model that leaves a lot of room for the possibility of gene flow and interbreeding, and that these hominins were adapting to very specific environmental circumstances. So this theory still, of course, states that Homo erectus left Africa about 1.8 million years ago. It doesn't necessarily debate that Homo sapiens could have originated in Africa, but it does say that essentially this transition to modern, fully modern Homo sapiens took place regionally. So those who believe in the multi-regional continuity theory don't necessarily distinguish specific species, they say, you know, once we get past Homo erectus, they basically say archaic Homo sapiens, and then late archaic Homo sapiens, early archaic Homo sapiens, and then fully modern Homo sapiens. So they don't necessarily distinguish the Homo heidelbergensis and the Neanderthals. Homo heidelbergensis are considered to be early archaics, and then Homo neanderthalensis are considered to be late archaics. So it essentially doesn't divide into species as much as the out of Africa model does. So this kind of graph here demonstrates these two theories for you. So you see with the out of Africa theory, you see a lot more branching events happening. So you see the out of Africa, the Homo erogaster left Africa 1.8 million years ago. And we've got this branch of erogaster, which is Homo erectus. So that is the European and Asian form of erogaster. And then we've got Homo heidelbergensis emerging here about 600,000 years ago. And then from heidelbergensis, we see these two branching events. We see one branch going off to the Neanderthals and another branch going into anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So according to the out of Africa model, the Neanderthals were essentially an evolutionary dead end and Homo heidelbergensis would have been the common ancestor of the Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, according to this model. So if you see somebody distinguishing Neanderthals as a completely separate species and as an evolutionary dead end, then you know that that person likely supports the classic out of Africa model. All right, and then the multi-regional model you see here is looking at Homo erectus originating about 1.8 million years ago or mi migrating out about 1.8 million years ago. And then as Homo erectus left Africa and migrated into Europe, the Middle East and Asia, all you see is these interbreeding and gene flow events. So all of these arrows are representing interbreeding, gene flow, and you're seeing this transition to modern Homo sapiens is taking place regionally. So it's happening somewhat differently in Europe than it happens in Western Asia, for example. But by the time you get to modern day, by the time you get to the last 100,000 years, for example, you're seeing anatomically modern Homo sapiens. So those are the two classic models. Um, the assimilation model, in my opinion, is kind of a compromise between the two, and at least based upon the evidence we have thus far and the genetic record and the paleontological record, I feel like this one makes the most sense. So this one, just like the out of Africa model, is stating that, of course, Homo sapiens did in fact originate in Africa. However, once they migrated outward, they did in fact interbreed with other hominin species they encountered, such as the Neanderthals, and now we know possibly the Denisovians, possibly Homo naledi, possibly uh, Floresiensis. We never know. But essentially, this model leaves a lot of room for the possibility that Homo sapiens not only encountered other hominins, but also interacted and interbred with them. So this model also suggests that current models do not adequately explain modern human origins. So it kind of denies or throws out the classic out of Africa or the multi-regional model. This model doesn't feel that either one of those adequately explains the origins of humans. And this model is supported by several factors. It's supported by fossils that are somewhat mosaic or mixtures of primitive and dry features. Some mosaic fossils may also indicate interbreeding of species and swapping of genes. And it's also supported by the Neanderthal genome study, 
and the fact that there were a variety of hominin species present the last 300,000 years of modern human evolution. So essentially those later members of genus Homo. So those were the, the species we're talking about here that were present are the ones that we've talked about in the second half of this lecture. So essentially Heidelbergensis, the Neanderthals, Homo sapiens, of course, Homo naledi, Homo floresiensis, and possibly others that we haven't discovered yet. But the assimilation model, just like it sounds, is looking at the possibility that the modern human genome was actually influenced by multiple species. All right, so I have one more clip for you that's kind of um, closing up this topic. So it's going to talk about, it's going to be John Hawks again. So now we're back to the First Peoples documentary. And we saw a little bit of John Hawks during our lecture last Thursday. But this one here is going to kind of delve into, not that one, this one. This one will delve into, again, that analogy of the, the deck of cards. So looking at the possibility that Neanderthals and Homo sapiens, possibly other species, were interbreeding with one another, swapping genes, and that the Neanderthals didn't actually go extinct, but they were genetically swamped. So essentially, there were, there were more Homo sapiens on the scene. So they became the predominant gene pool, but that doesn't mean that the Neanderthals didn't contribute to that gene pool. So let's watch this clip and then we'll talk about it. And they were sharing genes. If you imagine that this- In prehistoric Europe, Neanderthals faced the same sort of fate. Overwhelmed by the spread of modern humans. At first, Neanderthals and modern humans seemed to have been equal partners. They were sharing the landscape, they were sharing technology, and they were sharing genes. If you imagine that this deck of cards is modern humans, and this deck is Neanderthals, they're basically the same, but the Neanderthals have blue face cards, so just a little bit different. If we mix them together, that's what was happening in the European landscape. And you look at the resulting blend of populations, you can see that there's a good mix. You've got a lot of ordinary cards and a few of the blue cards. But then at some point, the balance of power shifts. Neanderthals are stuck in Europe, but modern human populations are growing in Africa and Asia. And you get wave after wave of new populations coming into Europe. As they do, it's like mixing in more and more of these decks of cards. So what you end up seeing is that the population is almost uniformly modern humans with just a little bit of Neanderthal. That means that the Neanderthals were swamped. They were absorbed into the modern human population, genetically, physiologically, and culturally. One of the key routes into Europe was via the Danube River, it flows from the Black Sea through Eastern Europe into modern-day Germany. A thousand miles upriver, it passes through the region of Swabia. In modern times, the river has changed course, but 40,000 years ago, this was the Danube Valley. It was home to a new wave of modern humans spreading through Europe. They lived in limestone caves, like this one, Holefels. For 17 years, archaeologist Nick Connard has been working here, directing excavations exploring the human history of this cave. So, Jane, more little treasures? Have you been finding uh, bird bone or mainly uh, charcoal? Uh, a few very small pieces. They find artifacts made by Neanderthals and modern humans, but never from the same date. There's a 2,000-year gap between the last Neanderthal and the first modern human. A fascinating question is what happened when modern humans arrived? What was the situation? 
we would expect modern humans and Neanderthals to have met here. Interestingly, that's not the case. When we look at the deep deposits at Holofels, we can show that Neanderthals were living here for many thousands of years. But when modern humans arrived, the cave was empty. That raises a question, why was that the case? Why weren't Neanderthals visibly here on the landscape when modern humans arrived? Conard believes that by the time they were here in Swabia, the two types of human were on a different trajectory. Judging by the artifacts they made, modern humans had taken a quantum leap forward. The Venus of Holyfells was made 35 to 40,000 years ago. It's the oldest sculpture of a human body found anywhere in the world. It's interesting to look at what is depicted and what's absent. What is most prominently absent is the head. There's no head at all. Instead of a head, there's a ring showing that it was used perhaps as an ornament or worn around the neck. What is present are the sexual characteristics. The pubic triangle and the vulva are very intensely cut out, showing that the genitalia of reproduction were important. The breast, enormous breast, oversized, also consistent with the idea of fertility and uh, reproduction. You can imagine after spending months being holed up trying to survive the long cold winter. And then the spring comes. The grass comes up, the animals start to have something to eat. I mean, the joy we have at the end of the winter, it would be nothing compared to these people who have been hunkering down in a cave just trying to manage over those long months. idea of the connectedness between people, human reproduction, animal reproduction, that all is what this uh, figurine's about. In neighboring caves, archaeologists have found other figurines, carved from mammoth ivory. animals that populated the Ice Age landscape. They are some of the most exquisite art objects ever made. The crown jewels of European archaeology. One of the most intriguing figures is neither animal nor human, but both. Eleven inches tall, the Lion Man of Holenstein Stadel is thought to be some kind of religious icon, a shamanic totem. But he's not alone. A miniature version of the same figure was found at Holefels, 30 miles away. The remarkable thing about the Lion Man is that we have two Objects that, although they're very different size, are actually the same thing. Combinations of lions and humans being depicted in two different valleys. When you find a second one, it makes it very clear that this was part of their ideology, their system of beliefs, showing that there was interaction between these people, that they existed in a social network, were from the same culture, spoke the same language, perhaps exchanging mates, economic ties. They lived adjacent to another, but were in frequent contact with one another. Archaeologists at Holefels have also found a bone flute. Made 35,000 years ago, it's one of the oldest musical instruments in the world. 
the best bones to make flutes of are uh, wing bones of big birds, for example, vultures or uh, eagles or swans. It's the same like our lower arm. And the first step to make a flute out of it is to cut off the joint ends with a flint tool. Wolf Hein is an expert in paleo reconstructions. He's worked out it would have taken prehistoric people four hours to make a bone flute. One may wonder why did people spend so much effort on making a musical instrument at that time? And for me, the answer is obvious. Music is the glue that keeps a society together. If you live for a long time on a small space with a lot of people, there will be aggression, there will be social tension. And the best thing to keep these tensions away is making music. The question is, what did the flute sound like? Jimi Hendrix did it better, but this is my interpretation of the Star Spangled Banner, just for you. Thank you. Once modern humans had opened a route through the Danube corridor, the population kept growing. Africa was like a pump, pushing more people into Europe. The central zone between the ice sheets and mountains was prime real estate. It became one of the most densely populated parts of the prehistoric world. A hub of social connections. Art was key to this expansion, allowing people to share a culture of beliefs to forge their own identity and mark themselves out as different. By contrast, there is no evidence from Swabia that Neanderthals made any complex art or music. Is that because they weren't capable of such things or didn't need them? There were fewer Neanderthals living in smaller groups that were less mobile they never formed the social networks so key to modern humans in Europe. The number of people a Neanderthal interacted with over the course of his or her life would be perhaps dozens or scores of people. Modern humans it could perhaps be many hundreds of people. Modern humans had an enormous wealth of objects, figurative objects, musical instruments, ornaments that they needed to identify each other, to communicate with each other. Neanderthals didn't need that, and when they encountered it, it was unfamiliar to them and they struggled with it. Since Neanderthals were discovered over 150 years ago, scientists have been trying to work out what happened to them. Why did they disappear? We used to think they were outsmarted by modern humans. But it's possible they were numbered. there would have been no great moment of extinction. Instead, they would have been gradually assimilated by us, modern humans. The Anatole population seemed to be extremely small, a few thousand people on a continental level. Modern humans, for some reason, were able to reproduce faster and more successfully than Neanderthals, perhaps also relying on, cu on culture more. Uh, but this would have made, in fact, all the difference. Neanderthals didn't really have a chance in the end. 
When Neanderthals ceased to exist as a separate species, two peoples became one. But Neanderthal genes live on in our DNA. Once we lived in a world inhabited by all kinds of humans, Neanderthals, Denisovans, probably several different kinds in Africa, and now they're all gone, and we're the only ones that are left. We won the game. We were better at connecting, better at creating networks, better at living in larger groups. And those things all feed on each other. Once you're living in larger groups, you're making more connections. You have to become more creative. It's an exponential process. Where we end up is, is here, in our modern complex world. This is the end result of those seeds sown by the first peoples as they left Africa and colonized every continent of the world. Homo sapiens, now the only human species on the planet. We may not have been so much smarter than other humans, but we were more plentiful, more social, more cultured. We absorbed their genes and shaped our world. Seven billion of us today are living proof. We are all children of the first peoples. Great. So I like that documentary because I think it does a really nice job of showing you how this process might have occurred, how these hominin species might have encountered one another, what happened when they did. What are the possible reasons for Neanderthal extinction or maybe not Neanderthal extinction? Maybe assimilation of Neanderthals into the modern day gene pool, assimilation of, of the Denisovians. So let's go ahead and we're going to stop share. We're going to turn the recording off. And then we're going to look at our